Where's the thingy? The thingy my bob. Thank you. That's the thingy my bob. All right. Don't need it. Cool. Thanks. It's bright up here. Hi. Uh, my name's. But I, I'm Ken Kemish. This is Johan Ardal, and uh, this is the company that we're from. And we're trying to make DNA sequencing faster and cheaper and more accurate. And uh, we really believe in what we're doing there. And uh, I'm going to talk about what that has to do with SENS, what that has to do with curing aging. So DNA sequencing, this wonderful thing that we're trying to create, um, trying to get the next generation of it, the one where you can really trust the data and get a huge amount of it quickly and, and be able to accurately assemble very complex things. So, we want it to be this wonderful, and when it is that wonderful, how will it help us cure aging any faster than we already are? So, um, this is Johan, uh, Johan and Mark Kamalainen, who are both MitoSense researchers. I was a Lysosense researcher. We joined Halcyon because we wanted to uh, pursue its path to curing aging, and we also really firmly believe that on route we could help SENS move faster. Um, we're going to divvy up this talk in, in how sequencing as a tool will assist in two major ways of looking at sense-related damage. Um, and it's very simplistic. Johan is going to take cellular damage, and I'm going to look at molecular damage. So without further ado, Johan. All right, hey. So you have the clicker? There it is. Right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how how sequencing can help replenish sense. I know that uh, we're not senses and actually have we don't, don't actually have any plans to do any of those therapies, but there are a lot, a lot of other people working on them. Um, so yeah, basically replacing cells in tissues who are losing cells. Um, there are three three viable cell type candidates for this or three main ones, I should say. We have the embryonic stem cells. Um, they have some problems due to the availability of them, um, immune suppression, suppression issues. Um, they also have some of the same mutational issues as <coughs> IPS cells do. Uh, then there are autologous adult stem cells, stem cells from your own tissues. There you avoid the immune system rejection problem, but you're stuck with problems growing them and harvesting enough of them. And lastly, you have the induced pluripotent stem cells. All these are human cells, and they're the most resilient. So you can take basically any any cell and use certain vectors, reprogram reprogram the, the cell, and try to achieve the same potency as adult or and or embryonic human stem cells. And I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about three papers that showcase some of the unique difference, differences between IPS cells and human embryonic stem cells and figure out how sequencing can help us figure out how to make how to increase the potency of IPS cells, make them more like human embryonic stem cells perhaps. Um, this is one paper, it's hard to see for me here. So yeah, somatic coding mutations in human induced pluripotent stem cells. We're basically looking at 22, 22 induced pluripotent stem cell fibro fibroblast lines um, reprogrammed using five different methods. And in each, each, in each of these cell lines, they find, they estimate an average of six mutations per line, half of which are implicated in tumor agenesis. Although half of these, again, are mutations you can find in very low levels in the fibroblast you started with. And that might be due to the total expansion these cells have to undergo to get to grow the numbers of them after you have done the actual introduction of the vector and the reprogramming. And one interesting figure from this, from this uh, paper is one showing that 
the age of the donor is not the mutation load in these cells isn't doesn't correlate with the age of the donor of the cell. So one quote from the paper, extensive genetic screening should become a standard procedure to ensure that human induced pluripotent stem cells are safe for clinical use, which is where sequencing comes in. There's another paper looking at uh, hotspots of aber ab aberrant epigenomic reprogramming in human induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically, you try to do whole genome profile, <coughs> methylome profiling of IPS cells and try to look for differences between embryonic stem cells and IPS cells. Um, they are quite similar, but there are quantifiable differences, uh, differences that are common between different lineages of IPS cells. So, I think the basic point I'm trying to make is that understanding the differences between the ES and IPS cells can help you make more robust IPS cells, perhaps make IPS cells that closer emulate embryonic stem cells. But embryonic stem cells also undergo a lot of mutations during clonal expansion. And in one paper, which is this one, they looked at, or they reviewed papers that looked at trisomy 17, which is common in uh, embryonic stem cell cultures, but it has not been reported in IPS cell culture, suggesting that they both have their distinctive flaws, if you, if you wish. And also interesting that they looked at methods used using non-viral vectors, proteins, mRNA, microRNA, and it, 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 it doesn't look like the vector itself is causing these mutations. So you have a quote here as well where the researcher basically describes why screening is figuring out these changes would be important for future research. All right. And that's the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, okay, so there you go. From, uh, from something uh, uh, ridiculously complex, uh, the vagaries of changes in uh, human genomes, um, to this hit list that I think is, I think there's still sort of research bounties on everything up here. So, um, th this, this is what I spend my time going after when I worked on SENS with uh, John Schlondor and Justin Rebo uh, under Professor Bruce Rubin in biodesign. And um, when, we, when we weren't busy like uh, doing what we did that summer, um, we would often daydream about ways to go after these that there wasn't quite the toolkit to go after, or there were very difficult techniques that aren't quite to prime time yet where it would be too arduous to, to get some leverage on going after these. But, the toolkit is changing, it's evolving, and I think we're going, to, we're going to be able to really brutally and specifically smash these uh, in all sorts of interesting model contexts uh, in a useful, usefully short amount of time. And I think sequencing can help. Um, so I'm gonna talk in a, in a general fashion about a set of molecular genetic techniques designed to go after things like this. Uh, I'm gonna talk about directed evolution and I'm going to talk about how sequencing relates to directed evolution and how it can help us move faster towards figuring out how to remove these very specifically. So, um, a, a favorite topic of mine uh, from that time, thinking about these methods, uh, is, is this very difficult uh, technique called mRNA display that several of you here will have either tussled with or at least heard about. Um, one of the things that made it very exciting at the time when Jack Shostak showed this back in 2007 is that it, it was the first time that a more or less random de novo area on a protein was evolved to have a specific catalytic function in vitro. So um, the, this, the, this, this, this technique, uh, the, the, the molecular manipulations you're doing in this technique 
allow you to have your protein of interest directly attached to a transcript, which can then be amplified and, and used in other contexts for further experiments. Um, so direct evolution, big picture of it, agriculture is what we've been doing with directed evolution for thousands of years. Now we're down to the point where directed evolution can hit individual molecules. Uh, I have a friend I work with who, who has attached uh, more than 24 billion unique small molecules to DNA. Um, so that chemical space is being hacked away at. And, and in this paper, an interesting thing about this paper, um, and uh, an interesting thing about this paper is that when you, when you look at a technique like this, the whole point of it is that iterative rounds of selection will drive the fitness of these constructs toward uh, the output that you want. In this case, we want highly specific, efficient remediation of all of those presumed bad guys uh, that, that accumulate with aging. And um, th there, there, there are a number of fairly straightforward uh, chemical biology techniques uh, where this could be applied. But it's, it's kind of a scary technique. But one thing about it is, if, if you look at some of, if you look at Shostak's data in detail, you see that in the first round, the things that eventually survived after 20 argu arduous rounds of these molecular genetics manipulations, that those were present early on. So instead of doing 20 rounds, if you've got sufficiently high quality deep sequencing, you do one round and you design your next round more intelligently and maybe you skip, uh, you, you get to skip a lot of those rounds, save a lot of reagent costs, and you might also be able to you might, you might also be able to navigate the fitness landscape in a way that we're not currently able to. It's hard to get these enzymes out of these techniques. Um, and uh, this, is a, th this is a related technique we often dreamed of uh, that would, uh, w where sequencing would make a big difference in what you could pull out. Uh, say, say, you had a, say you have a plot of ground in some random place or in hundreds of them. We got soil samples from around the world where we were trying to find bugs in those soil samples that would remediate some of those targets. And instead of doing that, uh, uh, something, something uh, that might have been a lot more interesting but not accessible at the time uh, would be to uh, characterize the transcriptome uh, in situ for an environmental sample to actually see what, what's really going on in the biology as these things do or do not incorporate your stable isotope labeled products. So you have a way of seeing which organisms in the community are taking up your product. There were several, uh, several instances of us not being able to get an enrichment culture on an important lysosense target. And I, I think we could have learned some very interesting things from a technique like this. But sequencing will make this more interesting as, as we go on because uh, because you're going to have the back end power of, of more powerful statistics if you're actually looking at a lot of these things. Um, something, uh, something more recently, uh, a breakthrough coming out of uh, some people who work with George Church at Harvard, um, is, is, this, is this very beautiful, uh, very, very nicely targeted, highly multiplex technique called multiplex automated genomic engineering, MAGE. And, um, uh, th this, is, this is data from a few years ago just showing that, um, uh, I I in short, that you're able to selectively mutate a, a large number of loci across the genome of these things in a completely roboticized fashion. Being able to explore uh, these fitness landscapes is something else that's being worked on um, by Iapis et al. Experimental illumination of a fitness landscape. This, this starts to show that that we're on the verge where deep sequencing techniques will, will potentially allow us to completely understand the molecular evolution of binding pockets or catalytic activity. I think we can get there. Um, and just, uh, uh, just uh, kind of uh, ending on a, on a general note is that we're doing sequencing because we also want to program and hack soft matter. And we think that that's a really big chunk out of the death pie, if we can achieve that. And, um, and there are amazing things emerging in our ability to manipulate matter with molecular genetic systems. So thank you. Thank you. Hey, Kelsey. So, hey, Kelsey.
Ben. Uh, I'd like to thank Halcyon for sponsoring the open bar, first of all. Uh, I thank know you. that you had an active thank hand you. in that, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I'm fairly familiar with what you guys are doing, and I'm a huge fan, obviously. Um, one thing I was wondering about your technology, particularly as you're discussing ways that it might be applied for some of these other indications, um, I'm wondering if you guys, uh, what you guys have thought about in terms of genome annotation. So there's the two parts of the puzzle, right? You have to sequence it, and then you have to annotate that in a, an efficient manner. Um, is that something that you guys are planning on doing in-house, or are you going to be collaborating with different groups to uh, maintain the annotation on? Uh, the annotation. So um, I, 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 I wouldn't say it's like an, an official statement on behalf of Halcyon because I, I don't know how many decisions are, are to be made there. But my guess is that what we really want to just satisfy are systems biologists saying flood us with data and that's going to need to be outsourced. I, I don't think I, I think, I think there has to be a deluge of data and I don't want us to be hanging on to it. And I'm not sure we want to like have have to think about the architecture of of an annotation group. So I think that's where we want to collaborate with the community. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, there's only time for one more question. S since I now know that you're sponsoring the open bar, I don't want to say anything negative. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But let me just ask you if I understood something correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, regarding the directed molecular evolution. Yeah. Nor the reason that Shostak chose that kind of a process is yeah. because the, the selective process is much smarter than we are. It's faster right. than we can select things. Right. And you're saying you're going to speed it up. Right, by, right. Am I doing something wrong? No. And you're saying you're going to speed it up by intervening it, it, with, with sequencing. Right. Time-consuming process, although eventually not so expensive. Right. So, and not One way I can make sense of that, yeah. and, and tell me if I'm on the right track here, yeah. is that you would look for mutations which increase in frequency in a population of cells or of individuals over repeated generations. That would be one way to, to, to kind of see the phenotype at the molecular level before you wait for it to actually appear as the predominant molecular species. Is that what you're going to do? And if you are, what about drift, which is also you know, going, going to baffle you in a genome of three billion? Yeah, you know, um, so, yeah, so uh, one thing, one thing Shostak confirmed for me when I, when I proposed this idea to him was that likely you can shortcut yourself at the first round. You can move a lot faster by making better scaffold choices in terms of finding a high affinity thing but when you're doing something complicated, like trying to find a high turnover catalyst, you're going to have to get a bit tricky. You're going to have to go deep, potentially. This is, this is new territory. Um, it's, not, it's not guaranteed to work. Um, to the other point about drift, um, I don't presume to be an expert in evolutionary genomics, but I hear from evolutionary genomicists, give us data, give us tons of it. So I trust. That, that they have models they want to test and that they're hungry for this data. So, so. Okay, thanks again. Cool.